In the 1950s, air travel was booming. Airplanes were getting bigger. Intercity air travel was on the rise, and cities were getting more congested. This created a problem of long commute times for short-haul travelers. To give an example, if you commute between New York and Boston, it would require the following. First, you have to arrive at JFK Airport at least an hour early if you wanted to bring more than a carry-on, and it will take you an average about 40 minutes to do so. Then, you check in your bag, go through security checks, then you get to sit at the gate and wait, hoping the flight isn't running late. Finally, you get on the plane and wait again and again due to ground delays. But once you get up in the air, the flight time is hard to beat in a helicopter. Arriving in Boston, however, is another story. Taxi times are an average of five minutes, but can go much higher. Getting off the plane usually takes another five minutes, unless you sat in the exit row, then you make a long walk to the baggage claim, which takes about 10 minutes. After all that, you leave the airport for half an hour's drive to downtown Boston. From door to door, assuming everything is on time, that's about four hours. The problem with super short flights isn't the flight itself, but the hassle of getting to the airport and leaving the airport to your destination after landing, even though your flight time is just one hour. When you put together the time you spent on the road getting in and out of airports, you'll realize you've been on the road for over four hours. And here is where helicopter airlines came in. By using a helicopter, the journey of almost four hours is reduced to an hour and a half because you're taking off from a rooftop in Manhattan to a rooftop of wherever you're going in downtown Boston. In the late 1940s, Los Angeles Airways was the first to commence an airmail service, followed by scheduled passenger service in November 1954, making it the world's first scheduled helicopter airline. The main hub was Los Angeles International Airport, where passengers were flown to and from local area heliports, including Disneyland Resort and the Newporter Resort in Newport Beach. During this period, the helicopter airlines experienced a significant boom, as intercity transportation was easier and relatively cheap, and there was a lot of hope and potential in the helicopter airlines industry. But after 10 years in service, these airlines disappeared. What went wrong? Well, it turned out that nothing went wrong. But during those periods, none of these helicopter airlines were making money out of flying passengers because helicopters were simply too inefficient, too inexpensive, couldn't go fast enough, couldn't carry enough people to bring per seat costs down. And the only way helicopter airlines could break even was through government subsidies, which helped them offset operational costs. However, by 1965, the subsidy was gone, and the helicopter airlines began to face a lot of challenges. Los Angeles Airways, Chicago Helicopter Airways, New York Airways, and other major airlines failed. They couldn't keep up with balancing their books and generating profits became a problem. This, in turn, forced them to pack it all up. It's evident to note that one of the major reasons why wide adoption of helicopter airlines has not been witnessed since its prediction can be attributed to the cost of operation. Helicopters tend to be more expensive compared to fixed-wing airplanes that offer the same seating capacity or range and speed. A small two-seat helicopter may cost about $300 per hour, while a large helicopter may cost $500 per hour to operate. Travelers also cover standby costs, landing fees, and taxes. When landing at a major airport, the landing fees may reach up to $250. Standby costs average about $200 per hour, while taxes are often about 7.5% of the total. Fuel is a large portion of the cost of operating a helicopter. The average cost of fuel is $4.5 to $7 per gallon, depending on the city, resulting in $27 to $120 per hour in fuel costs. Another $30 to $50 per hour covers the pilot's pay. 
the remaining costs cover maintenance and insurance. Compared to airplanes, the cost of maintaining and insuring helicopters is often much higher. More aircraft crashes involve helicopters than any other type of aircraft, which increases the cost of insurance. Using the Bell B-206 as an example, the 206 cost about $600 per hour to operate. Don't forget that the pilot will be paid too. There's a cost of landing, cost of managing the helicopter, airline amongst other basic costs. This in total would run to some thousands of dollars per flight. What this means is that a helicopter like this would cost at least thousands of dollars per hour to operate when you put the variable and fixed costs together, but it can only sit about four to six passengers per flight. Now, as mentioned before that, the reason these airlines couldn't break even is that helicopters were simply too inefficient, too expensive, can't go fast enough, can't carry enough people to bring per seat costs down. Ferry Aviation introduced the Ferry Rotodyne to tackle this problem and their mission was simple to design a helicopter faster than anything ever existed, bigger, more fuel efficient, costs less than a plane to maintain, and will make helicopter airlines industry profitable. It was easier said than done. The Rotordyne wasn't just a better helicopter with improved speed, range, and efficiency, it was a revolutionary helicopter. It was more like a helicopter and a plane joined together with Photoshop because it has the basic features of a helicopter, like a main rotor, and the basic features of a plane, like wings and engines in tractor configuration. It was a lot more revolutionary. It is a hybrid rotocraft, known as a compound gyroplane or gyrodyne, and it doesn't work like a conventional helicopter. A conventional helicopter uses engine power to spin a rotor blade, which forces air down to create lift. Tilting the rotor is what allows the helicopter to move in a given direction. But the Rotordyne works entirely differently. In its case, the main rotor isn't powered by an engine like a normal helicopter. Also, there's no tail rotor to keep it stable like in a normal helicopter. For takeoff, landing, and hovering, the rotor was driven by tip jets at the end of each rotor blade. How it works is that a compressed air supplied by the turboprops would ignite to spin up the rotor. Once in forward flight, the tip jets will be shut off and the rotor would spin freely by the force of the relative wind. With this unique design, the Rotordyne flew faster than any helicopter in the world and it was far more efficient. But the compromise came at a cost. Eliminating the use of engines to power the main rotor in place of tip jets made the Rotordyne very noisy, and this noise comes from the tip jets. And that was a serious problem, because the Rotordyne is meant to solve the problem of intercity travel, not create more problems. Eight out of every ten people preferred the long commutes rather than have a noisy flying machine over the city. Ferry Aviation went back to the drawing board to fix this problem, and this time, they are not making another prototype. Instead, this improved model will be a production version. The improved model was larger, more capable, more efficient, could carry up to 75 passengers, and it promised to be 15% quieter. Airlines were interested, and orders were coming in from around the world which is promising for a new design that hasn't proved itself. But it was at this point Ferry Aviation started facing problems. To get the production version built, about $10 million more in funding would be needed from the British government. But the government had already lost interest in the project, and because of this, Ferry Aviation never got the money. The reason the government withdrew from the project is that, in the 60s, Britain's aviation industry was a mess. There were too many aircraft builders, but they weren't making sales. They heavily relied on government-sponsored projects and subsidies to stay in business, and the government was losing a lot of money. To solve this problem, the solution the government came up with was to force these companies, including Ferry Aviation, to merge 
that the Rotordyne project just wasn't taken seriously by the new management and they chose to pursue more promising helicopter projects instead. In 1962, the British government was facing economic pressures and they needed to cut down expenses. They considered the ferry Rotordyne as a white elephant project and decided to pull funding for the development and the dreams of the half-helicopter, half-plane that promised to revolutionize intercity travel was put to an end. In summary, the reason why helicopters are not used widely for commercial travel can be summarized in three major reasons. First, helicopters are very expensive to operate, up to several times more expensive per flight hour than compared to a conventional fixed-wing aircraft. On large helicopters, one hour of flight time can result in several hours of maintenance, which increases turnaround times. Second, helicopters are slow. Due to a helicopter's lifting system, there is a trade-off of hover performance and efficiency versus speed. The smaller your rotors, the higher your top speed in theory, but the less you hover, the more fuel you burn. Third, helicopters are loud, very loud, especially large helicopters. This is not compatible with many airports' noise abatement regulations, which limits where they fly. Helicopters are great, but they are a last resort transportation system. Almost any other mode of transport will get you there either cheaper, faster, or in greater comfort. But there are situations where nothing else can do what a helicopter does, and for those situations, it's perfect. So, do you think helicopter airlines will come back in the future? Let us know in the comments section, and don't forget to smash the like button and subscribe to our channel. Thanks for watching.